Okay, so now we actually have time for some check-ins and stuff. I don't think we have anyone from the public unless there's someone there in the memorial room with you, Cameron. Um, but of just, yeah, learning round table, report backs from city committees, diving into the budget. So we've got the public budget survey process and communications that Cameron's got stuff on and then stipends for city committees. We did the initial research and then Jeremy's got some other materials. Um, is that, that's, that's it for the agenda today, right? Okay, Whew. still plenty. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, so should we just do a check round of check-ins and any, um, yeah, learnings or report backs? Wrap them all up together. Um, I, I don't know, I can go, I, I started my new job and have been reading all about how um, prescription drug companies have manipulated the market and like just all about how the pharmaceutical industry works and um, just le learning a ton and it's so so messed up and there's so much happening on it like right now in uh, in the news with their kind of band-aids on the bigger problem of like price caps and things like that but it's just been um really interesting and obviously uh, related to all of our work 60 percent of or 66 percent of um, uh, bankruptcies in the U S come from, uh, uh, health issues, um, and health bills. So, um, and, and I'm super, a little frazzled cause I was to like one trying to work on my, figure out what was wrong with my computer and might have to go get a new computer today. <laughs> so, um, and I'll hand it over to Jeremy. That's okay. Hey, good morning. Um, doing well. Uh, as I was saying a little bit earlier, I decided to truck myself into our my workspace in Burlington, which I've done maybe five times this year, um, just needing a change of venue <laughs> from my four walls at home. Um, looking forward to a little bit of a break next week. Yeah, I don't have too much to report. Um, work has been very intense lately, so kind of all my my bandwidth, mental bandwidth has been focused on work stuff, um, which is good, but yeah, kind of cooked by the end of the day. So I'm here and looking forward to our conversation this morning. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I have nothing to report. I've been away in in sunny Arizona for the whole week. So, uh, and it was it was lovely. It was lovely visiting with my my son and family and his little family. And nobody gets I was saying before nobody gets much sleep there because there is a two year old and a eight month old. And um, between them, everybody's everybody's starts waking up around four in the morning. So, so. It, it was kind of hectic, but it was great fun. And I didn't do anything constructive all week. <laughs> but I went fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and nice when you say uh, the kids, uh, you know, get up very early. I remember my daughter, she used to get up really early and I used to watch the sunrise with her. <laughs> Since she stopped it long time ago, I don't remember the last time I saw sunrise. So, uh, yeah, uh, for me, um, I this week is the last week before a Thanksgiving break, so I'm really waiting <laughs> to have next week off, uh, and um, it has been pretty busy. Um, for me uh, at work, but I was um, preparing um, class for my class, you know, some, I read some of the um, resources about what young leaders are concerned on the global issues. And it is very interesting. Uh, they are concerned, the studies show that they are concerned about um, climate change racism and one more thing that i don't remember right now but there was nothing about social justice or anything so i don't know if 
they don't know about this. So which means that we should educate them more, the like future leaders, young generation about it, or they don't think that it is less important than the climate change. So I haven't decided that, but it really raises some questions in my mind, which I want to uh, work on it a little bit more and to find out the answer for that. If they don't know it, I think it's a better <laughs> for us. So we have a chance, you know, to educate them. But it is the other one, I don't know what to do. So if they have a kind of list in their mind, which is important and not important, um, yeah, it sounds a little bit interesting for me. So that's all from me. Can I can I comment on that? Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, from the very beginning of this committee, there's there has been a I don't know if it's, we you say a tension, but certainly a problem about defining social social justice as distinct from racism, and and. Um, much of the early early discussions in the committee um, really just focused on the issue of um, of racism um, and not a broader and in, in my view at any rate not a broader vision of social justice because I see racism as a subset or of of social justice. Um, and I and and I think maybe that your your comment about well people don't, you know, young people don't see social justice as a, a major problem they see racism, and I think it's it's they're narrowing the the field of, of vision, and and I think that our committee actually had, you know stepped into that uh, because a lot of what we talked about in, in even in the survey was focused on racism. Um, not social justice, I think, across the board, because there are a lot of non-Black folks who are also suffering social injustice, which is also system systemic. Um, and um, and I and I think that you know part of maybe part of our job might be to broaden, you know, to, to try to educate people to broaden their vision about how how far into our society, you know, do we have to go? Should we be looking? To, to address large issues of, of social justice. Well, I, I always have been taught to look at social justice through the lens of a racism first lens, right? Because mm -hmm. to me, I see it as, as racism is our country's biggest elephant in the room, right? And if you address the racism, other isms will follow in being uh, addressed, you know? Um, so like, you know, sexism and other isms can follow after, because if you make it, if you make whatever policy or procedure or whatever you're trying to change system that is sort of in place to hold folks down based on race, then you are inevitably making things better for all. Right. So I've always seen it. Um, I've always been taught to address social issues or social justice issues through the lens of racism because it's relatable, people understand that, it also is the biggest fish to fry, right? So that's how always I've been taught about it. So I'm, I'm interested to, to, to listen, to learn more about another viewpoint or another way to look at this. Well, if you read the book Cast, I've forgotten the, the author's name. She, was, uh, she wrote uh, under a separate zone. And um, uh, she, she actually, puts racism uh, in the in the category of caste and, and, and argues is arguing that caste is really the problem um, because it, it 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 lumps a lot of other people in with it uh, and she and and her her other examples of caste are um, the, Hin the Hindu caste system and also oh, um, what was the other one that she used well I guess the, the Holocaust isn't that right? You read that book too, Shana, right? Yeah, I still have it. I need to give it back to you or if anyone else <laughs> pass it on. Yeah, I wish I could remember the author's name. It's sort of on the tip of my tongue, but- um, I'd love to read that. Isabel, yeah. Isabel, right, yeah. 
Um, and, and the other thing is that um, by, by focusing on racism, we lose a lot of support from, you know, let, let's call them, you know, white, white folks who are also struggling and who, who will not, who, who see racism um, as a, another problem. It's not their problem. And, and, um, and so they're not all that sympathetic to, to an approach to social justice through, through the eyes of racism. And, but I, you know, I agree that racism is sort of right in front of us um, and, and the most volatile, volatile issue. But I think we could make more allies if we, if we broaden, you know, the broaden the, 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 the definition. I guess one thing that I'm thinking of, and I can't speak very intelligently to it, but this idea of intersectionality, where all of the, the various isms that we're discussing do relate and interconnect, and it's not as simple as, okay, we're gonna deal with this issue, we're gonna fix that, we're gonna go fix this issue and this one. Um, so I think looking for those overlaps, and it's much more complicated than any um, one isolated issue. I think that I think I do think the class stuff is really important, especially in a place like Vermont. Um, and my partner's been doing. She she did a, a kind of course um, that was focused on kind of cross class dialogues as an entry point into thinking about whiteness and how you know white supremacy kind of dominates everything about our culture, um, but class is a really important component of that. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think it's tough to like pick and choose, um, but you do have to do meaningful work somewhere. Um, but I guess looking for those opportunities where things kind of like intersect um, is what I'm interested in thinking about too. The author's name is Isabel Wilkerson. It takes me in my, in my head a while to sort of <laughs> grind through that. But anyway, I recommend that book. I mean, um, I think it's a, it's a very uh, important and, and interesting way to look again at what, what it is that we're, we're about. Uh, I think it's very um, good discussions, uh, discussion we are having now. Maybe in the future, we can add our agenda to uh, have survey or to talk to uh, high school students or college students about their um, ideas, social justice, and you know, racism or other things we just uh, talk, then maybe we can also do something, you know, as an advisory board to offer schools, right? Just advice, oh, you should do these things to educate. Uh, the students or something, because uh, this is um, <clears throat> the study I just share with you. It's from World Economic Forum, and it affects current leaders, all their studies and all their conferences. They bring all current important leaders together every year. And if they are talking about global leaders, which these people are kind of chosen, right, for this conferences and everything. So it shows the future of our world. Yeah, I like the idea, Pellin, of um, some more focused conversations with young people. The, what I, I, would, I would kind of flip it though, and, and one thing you said, I'm actually more interested in learning from them than me educating a younger person. I, um, yeah, yeah, I, I understand I like your point. Their experience is so pivotal to like how we as an old, older people, I'm an older person now, kind of like make space for them. Um, so yes, there's mentorship, of course, from, from maybe experiences that we've had, but I think we, we've got to start meeting young people where they are and getting them engaged in this kind of a work, work that we're doing in the committee. So I, I, yeah. I love that idea of Yeah, that's why, yeah. Better. That's why I said we should ask them first to learn from them. Then we can just advise, right? What we can do uh, 
to create a better world for them, right? Not mm -hmm. for us, but for our future generation, because they will be dealing all the problems, as you said, old people created mm -hmm. for them. And it is not fair, right? <laughs> Yeah, and so I just put in the chat too on today's MRPS school board meeting. They're actually going to be talking about how they're hiring a facilitator to support their their school's learning. Um, about what you know, they're talking about like high. You know, it's it's a little bit broader, but you know, as you know, the MRPS also hired creative discourses to run their own internal work. And so I, I do think they're doing a lot of that work like kind of through the school. And so maybe, um, I think we have a lot of priorities that we're working on right now, but I think maybe we could like can just connect and do a report back from MRPS school board members about like what, what they are doing. Um, yeah, I hope it, uh, you don't misunderstand me. I hope I'm not saying something wrong, uh, but my daughter applied for our committee and she was chosen and it was announced by city meeting and her school told her she is in our committee, but somehow she doesn't receive anything or oh, welcome here are uh, you know meetings and I have been telling her, honey, you should you should email Shana and Cameron, so we have a rep representative in high school. So yeah, I don't I don't know why that was I don't that hasn't been communicated to me that we had a new member when was this do you remember oh very long time ago and it's it, her name is in the city a meeting uh, it's YouTube right they announce her name yeah you know, we accept uh, I can ask her but it's like I don't know at least three months oh Helen I'm so sorry three, four mon months ago yeah and I don't I told her I don't want to you know, do anything for you, right? It's your responsibility. So she talked to school, her school, they said, okay, we will talk to city and your committee. She hasn't heard anything. And again, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be my daughter, right? But I know that other committees- Yeah, that's unfair. Student, student oh. representatives. So we have opportunity to reach out young people all the students in the committees, they are representative, representatives of city. So we can create more impact that I think we can imagine <laughs> through our student uh, committee members. I'm really sorry about that. I'm going to follow up on that today, see what's going on. And what is her name, Palin, again? Alara. I am. Um... Right here. here. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and uh, just, I know I, you're probably emailing about that right now, Cameron, but if I, I do want to make sure if you have a chance to check in bef before diving into our agenda as well. Oh, uh, it's budget season. So my brain is melting out of my ears. I don't really know where I am in the world or time, uh, but um, staff has been taking uh, equity really seriously in this year's planning. It, like I've said, it's it's been really diffused through our work plans and um, your tool has been very helpful in framing conversations about new budget asks. Um, uh, just for a fun preview on our budget, it's, I, I'll get into that when we get to the budget survey process or the budget process, but um, it's a lot. So uh, that's really what I've been focusing on and working on. So thank you. Um, sh okay, should we review and approve the minutes from the last meeting? Thank you so much for Jeremy for taking them. Um, if folks want to pull those up real quick. I think Michael already looked them over and made some edits and the updated one is in the uh, most in the email that I just sent out. And welcome Lauren, we just wrapped up doing our check-ins and we're going into the, um, uh, the, the um, minutes of uh, reviewing minutes from the last meeting. Hey, good morning everyone. Sorry, I missed this with starting early. 
Morning. Morning. Nice to see you all. We were, we were just doing check-ins. If you do want to do a check-in or we can dive dive right in too. <laughs> oh, I'll I'll find here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> A motion to approve the minutes. I motion. Uh, to second. Michael second. <laughs> That's quick. Awesome. All okay. in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Yay. Process. Okay. Um. So diving into budget. So Cameron. Um. Budget. Public budget survey process and communications. If we wanted to start there. So that's not out. So um, I don't have any updates on that, but I do have an update on our budget. So um, we're okay. in the middle of our budget Congress right now, which is where departments have been sort of told by council, what, well, the mayor really is, is where she's interested in, in looking to start the tax increase, right? So last year we put forward a budget we, I say staff, put forward a budget that had a zero increase, right? So there was no tax increase. It was level funded across the board. We took a lot of cuts in fiscal year 21. And so we level funded those cuts. And so we didn't have a budget that had a tax increase. So we're aiming for a 4% tax increase. Um, but I don't know where that'll end up. Obviously, that's council's determination to 100%, right? We're just trying to get in as much as we can for as little as we can, right? That's the goals all the time. And it is looking not awesome. We still do not have return to revenue that we uh, did pre-COVID. Uh, we're not sure if this is like the new normal or if this is just gonna be ongoing for in recovery mode for the next few years. Um, a lot of what we're putting on the table will have to be council decisions. And so um, that that's to say that just basically coming in at base budget is going to have a pretty large increase over a, a nothing budget, right? Does that so it feels artificially inflated when we say the budget is going to be X over what it was last year because we're just trying to return to providing services at the same level as we were before we took all those huge cuts. And so um, uh, it's not, it's going to be a challenging budget year. And so a lot of the programming are all of the things that we're trying to prioritize that are outside of our core services, like improving anything extra, all the projects that we have, all of the infrastructure stuff is going to need to go to council to, for voting and prioritization. We think this is where we're at right now. So I can't speak in any definites, but this is just sort of where we're planning. Michael, hey, you had your hand up, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, interrupt me when I'm rambling. No, no, that was actually related to what you were saying. Is there any indication about um, how much the state is going to get uh, from the infrastructure, new infrastructure bill and how much of that and how that's going to be distributed? No idea yet. Um, our, we don't know. Um, yeah. I think it's going to take a while for that to sort of shake loose and have us understand. So it's very hard also in our planning for the future is like we acknowledge that a lot of money may be coming through the infrastructure bill, right? Mm -hmm. But much like ARPA, where we think we get X amount of funds, those funds are actually very tied up in rules and regulations, right? So we could say we have like a million dollars coming in for ARPA, but we don't really, right? Because it only applies for certain things. So I expect that money that's coming from the infrastructure bill will be similar, will be like the ARPA funds where it's tied to very specific things. And so here's hoping that all of the things we're trying to do fit into those right. uh, rules. So we don't know yet. Our um, The local VLCT is... Uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns is really looking into that for us. That's sort of their their role in helping us figure out what that means. So um, they'll be letting us know as soon as they do, right? Um, so all that to say really is that I, 
I'm very interested to see what the budget ask for stipends will be. And then again, that will really just be up to council and what they want to include in a budget to whatever they want to increase or decrease or whatever this tax increase. So sort of we're in our, we're in the thick of planning right now. And um, I'm just not sure what, what the, uh, hmm, what am I thinking? What are the words? what the flexibility is going to be with this budget. Can you remind us what the timeline for it is too in the decision making? Because this yes, is let me, start July 2022, right? It, it would, yes. Let me pull up the timeline so that I can actually speak intelligently about this. Hold on. Uh, Sorry, y'all, there's a lot of budget um, emails back and forth. <laughs> Not too surprising. <clears throat> uh, I should know this off the top of my head. I just don't. Nope. Is it this? Nope. <laughs> okay, budget development timetable. Okay, I found it. All right, so we are in November now, which is terrifying. So today, So the next big thing is finalizing our projected budget for department head review, December 1st. We would then be also trying to finalize any proposed bond items by December 1st. So council's next, all of their meetings through the new year will be budget focused. So Tonight is the last night of like regular business. And then they're gonna go directly into just like finance and budget for basically now on. Um, our CIP committees are meeting to discuss capital improvements. Let's see what else we got. The finalizing the budget for council consideration will be December 3rd. Um, and then all of the following council meetings will be budget related. The first one in December will be the city manager's budget presentation, which is basically where we go over, here's what staff has come up with. Please tell us what your thoughts are and what your priorities are at council. And then, yes. sorry. No, I thought you were, that was the pro presentation. Keep going. <laughs> oh no, there's, it's a long, uh, long process. Um, then, uh, in January, we'll have our public hearings on bonds if that's necessary. Um, then we will have uh, the community fund will be weighing in on their um, budget allocations in January. And then our annual meeting day is March 1st, and that's when the budget is voted on. Because that's what I was going to say. It was so for community fund board. Um, I, there, they said they're anticipating level funding for that. And so that's kind of what we've been working off of there. And so I think for, um, you know, CJAC, we, we were also anticipating level funding or, you know, we, you know, have the funding for this year and then anticipating level funding for next year. And then we're making this proposal for additional funds to be spent for city for you know stipending city committee members. Um, so I guess where do, do those still seem right? And where do you anticipate some of these budget cuts that you're um, you know discussing? And, and yeah, where 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 do you where do you see some of? Are you going to ask you know committees to volunteer, or is it going to be in staff? Or yeah. 
So a lot of those cuts are coming from large scale projects and programming. Uh, the things that are, your budget is proposed to be included, to continue to be included. That's a commitment that council made. And so we understand that that's a priority. So that's continued in there. Funding to the homelessness task force is also included, just so y'all know, because I think that sort of ties into things that y'all care about. Um, so your ask, let's see here. Funding requests due from commission boards and commissions uh, November 30th is when Kelly wants that. I don't know why I skipped that. Let me highlight that and put it in the minutes. So, but I think, I mean, y'all have a pretty strong proposal that can go to council. Council can decide to do whatever they want, right? They can they can vote to have a 7% increase. I don't know. Um, so I just would suggest that, you know, we move into Jeremy talking about what your proposal is, and I can turn that in, you know, for you. Yeah, does anyone else have any other questions or reactions or any, yeah. It's just a lot. We're still in the dead heat of COVID, you know? It's hard to remember that, I think, sometimes, but it's still affecting every part of everything we do, so. Mm -hmm. But I would love to hear what the proposals are, Jeremy. Yeah, if we're ready, I can share my thinking. Cool. Um, so basically sp spent some time um, considering or <clears throat> preparing for us to consider basically three different scenarios that we might suggest as a pilot program for offering stipends for committee volunteer work. Um, and I used Cameron's spreadsheet um, that you shared worked up last time as kind of the, the tool to fig play with numbers um, within those different scenarios. Um, so two of the scenarios I really only looked at in more detail around kind of running numbers, um, and I'll explain why. But the, the three different kind of scenarios I was thinking about to kind of get, get this down to a, a more feasible number that could function as a pilot a proof of concept for, for this idea. Um, so the, the first scenario would be um, some kind of an, an, an income cap for anyone who wanted to serve on a committee. If they fell under a certain income level, then they would receive a stipend for their service on a committee. Um, that, I ended up not going that route specifically because it's somewhat unpredictable um, because again it's dependent on well who applies um, and it's also um, it's a lot of administrative work because right. then you need to like not that you need to verify but there is a process you need to put in place to like vet applicants and understand what their income is um, which is laborious i think for everybody involved um, however one of the scenarios that i did work up i think it functions in a similar way um, so then the next two scenarios, and I'll, I'll show you um, the numbers in just a second. Then I'll call it scenario A was limiting the stipend pilot program to a select number of committees. Um, and in my scenario, I picked five um, very arbitrarily. I mean, my logic was, okay, here's some committees that are really kind of in the social justice kind of category of, of work. And, maybe need more representation from folks who don't typically volunteer. Um, and then the, the scenario B was settling on just a predetermined limited number of stipends that are available um, that it's kind of a first come first serve um, approach. So let me let me just show you the numbers because it'll be a little bit like it would here. be like you'd have to request it like someone would have to say I need a stipend to participate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. 
And I think also with, within these scenarios, I just settled on some parameters. They're highly, they can be highly variable depending on what we feel is a comfortable number to propose to council. So th there's a lot of flexibility. Um, okay, assuming everybody can see that. Yep. Um, okay, let me go to option A. So option A, oh my. Uh, let me sync that down. Is that somewhat legible? Yes. Okay. So option A, this is the, the option of just selecting a certain number of committees in which we would offer a stipend. Um, and so in this case, I picked five committees. Um, homelessness Task Force, Housing Task Force, Planning Commission, our committee, and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Um, and, and then I just ran the numbers. So within those five committees, um, we've got a top number of, mem of members, an average number of meetings, which yields totals in terms of total number of meetings. Um, and then I just kept Cameron's calculation here. So with those five committees, if we made dollars stipends available for any and everyone in those committees um, you're at 42,000 if you graduate down from 50 to 35 25 20 you get you know the dec decreasing amounts um, as far as um, stipend amount I'm having I really feel strongly 50s kind of where we should land as I'm thinking about what a stipend needs to do for somebody who needs it it, it needs to probably be able to support them if they need childcare. Um, it maybe needs to support them if and when transportation is a factor. Um, there's also um, perhaps time off from work that might be a factor for folks. Um, so we can, we can debate that number, of course, but 50, I would advocate that 50 is probably where we wanna land with the pilot um, going forward. So, and again, so you can play with this. Maybe we only wanted to select three committees instead of five. I mean, so you can, you can fudge the numbers in this scenario. Um, this is interesting to me. I really like the idea of a pilot and I don't know why I didn't think of a pilot, but I, it makes sense because then we can figure out if it's actually increasing or making any changes to the makeup of the committees. And if it's not, then it's not useful for our community, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely, as a demonstration of is this a feasible program that we would want to scale up um, and make more sustainable. Um, now let me show you option B. So option B in some ways I'm more I'm more interested in. Um, and there's some math here and you have to excuse my non math skills, but I, I think I did what I wanted to do. Um, so in this scenario, what we're doing is creating a total limited number of kind of committee memberships that have a stipend attached to them. So it's irrespective of any committee. And again, it would be open kind of to anyone first come first serve. Um, and so I had to come up with a number of total stipend positions. Um, the way I ended up doing that, and you can certainly poke holes in this, but I was thinking about just our population in Montpelier. Um, and what the income kind of brackets are for folks. Um, and so I settled on, well, what if the percentage of stipends we offer is the same as the percentage of our population who has an income of under $50,000 a year? And that's a household income. So in Montpelier, as in 2019, 36% um, of our population uh, reported an income under $50,000 a year. So I took that percentage number of 36% and I multiplied our total number of top committee members, which is 157, multiplied that by 36%, we get 57 um, committee positions. Um, then you, of course, what I did was I took the average of meetings per committee, which is 12, multiplied that 57 times 12. Our total number of meetings is 672. And so then I ran Cameron's calculation. So at that number, um, 
at $50 per meeting per member. We've got an amount of 32,006 and then so on. Um, so did that make sense to everybody? Because I went through a lot of numbers. So would this be a stipend per committee that they would be able to figure out how to delegate or it'd be like a stipend overall that people could? I just, yeah, it's a, it's a single bucket of money. Okay. It's first come first serve. Um, and again, and maybe this algorithm doesn't make any sense to anyone else, but okay, what's the number right amount? And I just went for that kind of broader population trend around income. But again, um, you could move this number up and down very quickly to adjust your final kind of bucket amount. Um, I just needed somewhere to start, so that's what I did. These both make a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much for doing this. I wish we had another city to act as our pilot, you know, like, yeah. and saying, you know, like, because I assume that something like 36% of it is what's going to be, you know, actually used. It's not going to be the 100% of it. You know, it's probably going to be like 35, 50, 60%, but we just don't know yet. And so I think that's kind of why I'm more curious about option a where it's like here's so we can say here's what the full budget's going to be like this is like we're more likely to try to get closer to this number but i think there's going to have to be like a lot of education and rollout and stuff in order to like this will be like maybe like long term what that would be but maybe by starting with our pilot we can more we can use that to kind of figure out what what are what are what are our rates um and and what how is this going to impact recruitment and how is this going to impact retention and everything else and then um you know it's like maybe like start with option a for like two years and then do end up doing option b but like of like knowing a little like having a little bit more clarity around is $50 good? Is it actually 36% of people who are applying? I mean, or it's like, um, yeah, and, and just kind of working out some of the kinks. That's kind of my like gut reaction, but I don't, um, I don't know how based in reality that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really appreciate the work here though. Sure. You're Lauren, can we cheat and ask you what your thoughts are? And what you would prefer to see? Um, so am I understanding it right that like the idea is just that a, would it kind of be like first come first serve to some extent if we just set a budget number and they're like, there's this much available, there's this stipend, like mm -hmm. we, I mean, just knowing the reality of like how appointments work and stuff, it's like only like a couple seats a year open up. So it's not like there's going to be wholesale change. So, you know, in terms of like everyone right now is doing it without a stipend. So, um, you know, it might make people uh, better able to participate or whatever if they might take it. But presumably it's like you're getting more people in who couldn't do it. I mean, I kind of like the just like set what a stipend is, set an amount, and do it as first come first serve, and see how many people are taking it, and then, and then I think like Shana said, doing the analysis of like, okay, is this getting new folks in who historically haven't been able to participate, and like then, like what's the right amount to calibrate from there based on what we're seeing? Although I agree, like we definitely part of it needs to be how are we advertising and how are we like making people aware of this and like just because it's there if nobody knows mm -hmm. about it it's not going to be helpful and so that like obviously is a big part of it so I don't think we could just like we'll have to judge the whole package of like what did we do to actually do the recruitment and the promotion and, and all of that to make sure that we're attracting people beyond just the stipend um, as a you know way to help people make it more feasible um, but I guess like for number I mean it the only other question about the amount is like some committees meet for, you know, 
three hours and some meet for one hour once a month? Mm -hmm. Like, is it the same stipend no matter what the time commitment or is it a per hour thing or a per, per month or just make it, make it simple and make it $50 per meeting and people will just know that <laughs> you could look at, you know, the commitment of the different committees as you decide what to apply for. Those are my, my first reactions, but I, I mean, overall, I think just like setting them out and then we can like use it as a pilot, mm -hmm. adjust, look at what we can learn. I like $50. It seems like it's enough that it could be real for people to like make a difference to let them participate versus like $25 or $20 or something. But that's just my gut reaction. Yeah, I think you raise a, a good point that didn't occur to me is that these numbers are quite high in the first, second, third year, perhaps, because we only have a so, so many number of positions that will be open in the first year. Um, so I don't know if there's a, if we have any data that could help us use that to factor in um, how many positions are maybe coming up open in the next year, and that could help us whittle the number down even further. Mm -hmm. I think it makes sense to ask for a chunk of money to be used as a pilot for this. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably all we staff would need. And then we can continue as a committee to work on what that would look like. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's important to sort of walk away with today with knowing what your total ask would be. Um, it might could be 42,000 and then just say, we'll figure it out from there. But just making sure that that like there is a number that can be def defended, def yeah, during this budget process so that we can at least include it in a package for council to consider, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it doesn't have to be. We don't have to figure out like what how it was going to be uh, used, but a number to, to start advocating for. Um. So the difference between the two just. To emphasize highlight that so our our select committee scenario option a if we make all of those positions stipend eligible we would need forty two thousand. option b is quite a bit less because we're not tying it to specific committee numbers but just a total percentage a, a percentage of the total number of committee positions that exist um, and according to this first calculation, that's 33,600. Um, so we've, those are two very different numbers, um, but could function equally as just like the pot and when we decide how to distribute it. Um, and I, I, I don't have enough experience to offer an opinion on if that's too much, not enough, unrealistic, so. Mm. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but I think the Essex one that passed was like 35 or some, you know, something. It was around that too. Mm -hmm. So these, these, this seems like for that one data point in line with that, <laughs> when, okay. you know, when the initial numbers were coming back, right. And it was a hundred thousand, it was a little bit like, whoa, that, that is more than I was expecting. So, um, we have a lot more committees than those folks right, than Essex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a lot more people engaged. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering if we should consult with creative discourses here, if this is how we should use some of that consulting money to check in with, you know, of like, what are the pros and cons of these different options? And, um, but I think, I think we should, yeah, if we set the money beforehand and put that forward to council and then figure out the proposal from there. Well, you should probably, I mean, I don't, hmm, am I acting my own self-interest right near? No, but you should definitely ask for the 42, just so okay. that you have that and then you can go down if that's required right but i would i would start with that higher number and then say this is you know we're going to propose a pilot project with this 42000 but here based on our basic math here's what it would cost to do a pilot program in montpelier and then it can come down to 33 depending on what y'all decide to do you know what i mean mm -hmm. I, I think if you just say right now, here's the higher number, and then you can talk it out throughout this process, right? 
So. I agree. Okay. <laughs> you um, you got to shoot for the moon and land in the stars or whatever. We, Cameron, what, when do we need kind of like first the rationale for the budget request and two, the details of what we might do with a pilot program for the stipend? Um, I think the numbers now right like today i would like to walk away from here kind of knowing where the number is and then we can work on and by i, I say we because i'm here but y'all can work on like the the how this would roll out whatever so that when it does go to council in december you'll have a a good um understanding of here's what we're asking for and why so i would recommend that at your next uh, your next meeting, um, you discuss this and VHIP only. So discuss stipend, um, I don't know, implementation mm -hmm. and, um, and VHIP. Um, but today walking away with a number is really great for me. So I can turn that into our finance department. Mm -hmm. And I would think for council for making the case for including it in the budget, it's more important that we have a really good one pager on why stipends are an important equity issue and what we hope to accomplish by offering them like that more so than here's the mechanics of how it will work. Okay. Um, I think it could be like, here's some considerations of how we plan to roll this out and we're working with creative discourse or, you know, like whatever that piece I think is less important than like why should we dedicate taxpayer dollars to this um, you know, particular initiative is yeah. the case that will be the more important for like the December timeline, I would say. Mm -hmm. And like and knowing that you are working on a good thoughtful plan for how to roll it out. But right. not knowing it. you don't need all the details yet, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's a good call. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Michael. Do we have any uh, information from Essex about what has been the response? I mean, how many people have signed up or what? It's being implemented in January. Oh, it's starting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Um, that's, that's too bad because it, it, yeah. it would help. <laughs> um, but they've, um, they have figured out how people apply for it and what information they need and other, you know, you know, how to, do taxes and stuff like that so we can learn from them for that oh one thing i did note in some of the research i was doing was the other examples i had seen um, of this kind of a stipend program um, cities were capping the total amount um, and i think i saw 500 as and that was for tax purposes for cities mm. so that didn't cross into like employee territory. That That's was definitely really important. Yeah, from Essex was there like, once you hit a certain threshold, then you have to do all these, I you know, do a lot of other forms and stuff. So um, yeah, maybe, yeah, we should consider something like that to avoid that issue. So cool. Okay, so we've got, um, on our next, we're gonna yeah, talk more about like the memo for the city council, outreach to city committees, um, other things related to the stipends. Um, uh, in the meantime, do we wanna reach out to creative discourses or, or hold off on that? Okay, yeah. Jeremy, could you do that outreach? Just as something like, like knowing a little, you know, feeling like you have more of the ins and outs of it, reach mm -hmm. out to creative discourses to do that. Who, who um, are the best contacts to reach out to? Probably Sue, um, and I can share that. Yeah. Yeah, she's just kind of been our main contact. Um, and then we're also gonna talk more about VHIP. Um, there's the readings that I've shared now a couple of times. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing those. Um, and then are we just not going to talk about the public budget communications and outreach? As our I'll get more information on, you're fine, Carol. I'll get some more information on what that looks like. Beautiful. Awesome. 
Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, and see you uh, at city council tonight. And um, I don't know, see, see the rest of you on December 1st. Thanks so much. Sorry, this ran a little bit over. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.